Welcome to the Unconventional Dyad Podcast, where you'll find broad topics, an unconventional dyad, and one shared goal, educating ourselves through challenging and engaging conversations. Your hosts are Carly and Laura, two graduate students and friends committed to having discussions that are real, raw, and unpolished. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm so excited to introduce Joy Jordan to you. She is a lead teacher and board member for the Wisconsin Prison Mindfulness Initiative, which has mindfulness programs in 15 Wisconsin prisons. She's volunteered in four different prisons, including both maximum and medium security prisons in Green Bay and Oshkosh and the Fox Valley area. Her mindfulness teaching takes her into prisons, corporate offices, nonprofit organizations, schools, and community classes. She really tries to live her life with a very open and curious mind, open heart, which means that her most important work occurs on the meditation cushion. For today's episode, we discuss a variety of topics, but I wanted to pull out and highlight a few that I found particularly meaningful. We discuss really seeing our own edges and bringing honesty into our lives. So if we are to hurt others, really taking ownership over that and apologizing and kind of reconciling the relationship. We also discuss working from a place of goodness and not necessarily out of a place of lack. So Joy works in prisons and does amazing work with inmates, really bringing awareness to who they are, reflecting back their goodness, mirroring back their goodness. So I found that particularly uh, meaningful. We also talk about Joy's work in schools and how she works with little kiddos in schools, incorporating mindfulness into their curriculum and really where she sees that going next. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. I am so excited to have Joy on and for her to get a chance to share some of her story. So Joy, thank you so much for being with us today and I am just absolutely thrilled that you are able to speak with me today. Can you start out by just talking a little bit about yourself, who you are, how you identify? Before I do that, Carly, I just want to say a huge thank you to you and to Laura that I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to meet. But just learning about your podcast and especially reading about how your training wasn't giving you enough uh, experience and difficult conversations. And I just think that's so inspiring, especially right now at this time uh, that it just inspires me that you and Laura are both doing this. So thank you for doing it. And thank you for having me here. Uh, About me, this is something just in the last week I've reflected on a lot with regard to the bios that we often write about Mm -hmm. ourselves for on a podcast or uh, serving on some committee or we're going to give a talk someplace and what those bios hold and what they don't hold. And so often we don't really get to know a person through their bio. So I'm just going to tell you some things that I care about that matter to me, some of my core values. That's perfect. Yeah. That I try to live my life um, not doing harm. Uh, And when I do cause harm intentionally or unintentionally, I try to make amends to rectify that. And that takes a lot of integrity and honesty. So those are definitely some core values that I hold. Compassion and generosity are really important to me in my life. Um, To care about other people and want to do something to help, to support, to relieve suffering. And love and presence and humility. Really, when it comes down to it, how would I want to be remembered? You know, after Mm -hmm. I'm no longer alive, I'm 
not going to want to be remembered by all my accolades and my achievements and all that I've done and the doings, but it's more of my way of being. And so trying to be present with people and bear mm -hmm. witness and to listen and to care and to love. These are things that mean a lot to me and how I'm trying to live my life. And I mess that up all the time. And then I get to begin again. But that gives you a sense of where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so refreshing to think of life as beginning again over and over again, not only in the life that we're in now, but also lives that might happen in the future. This idea of starting over, um, starting over new, being able to kind of rectify what has been done, uh, the mistakes that we've made. I find that really powerful. And I'm really happy that you started with that because who knows, maybe we'll make some mistakes during the podcast even and have to kind of reconcile what has been said. Mm -hmm. um, so where would you like to start? I mean, there, you, your story is so inspiring and I know that we were talking about this before we started recording but I found your story so inspiring so for me I was in an academic career I was in graduate school in biology and wasn't liking what I was doing and as I was starting to you know reconsider what I was doing with my life you certainly came to mind because I know that you had also gone through something maybe not similar um, necessarily, but you've had this kind of this this change in career, and I don't know exactly where you want to start with that, but um, I th thought it was important for me to share again just how inspiring your story has been to me, and it really gave me the courage to do what I really wanted to do. So, thank you. That makes I'm glad for that, and I'm glad mostly that you're finding what you want to do. That's what makes mm -hmm. me most happy. So to people that are listening, Carly is referring to um, how she and I met, which was at Lawrence University, which is a small, just lovely liberal arts college in Appleton, Wisconsin. And I was a statistics professor there for 14 years. So after college, um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had a degree in math. Uh, that was really a degree in statistics. And I love school. I've always loved school for a variety of reasons. It's a place of comfort for me, mostly. And I can talk more about that. But it was a, definitely a place of comfort. And nothing spoke to me of what did I want to do when I graduated. So I thought, well, why don't I go to school more? Because that sounds fun. And I applied to graduate programs in statistics and went to the University of Iowa. That's where I got my PhD in statistics. And within the first semester I was there, I had a position as a teaching assistant and I saw how much I love, I felt how much I love to teach. I love being in the classroom. And it was really then that I decided I would get my PhD, not because I loved statistics or the particular area of statistics that I was researching, but because I wanted to teach at a, a small college where I would really get to know the students and connect so that was really the whole reason for me to get my PhD was so I could teach at the college level. And then I did that for 14 years at Lawrence. And I still, Lawrence holds such a special place in my heart. I love it. But as time went on for a variety of reasons that I'm happy to talk about, I'm really an open book about all of that. I realized I needed to make a change. And there's a number of parts of that story, but it was really three years that I was very intentionally making modifications within the field of academia, I sort of is like shifting around the puzzle pieces. And then I realized I actually needed to just, I could leave academia, that that was actually a possibility. And I nobody I knew had done that before. Mm -hmm. So I decided to resign my tenured position and I let everybody in the community know why, that there was nothing wrong, nothing bad had happened. I was not ill. I was not moving away someplace. I just was leaving because I needed to align my inner and outer lives. Mm -hmm. 
my husband will often comment when I jokingly say it was a midlife crisis. He said, Joy, that's not an exaggeration. It's not the midlife part that's important there. It's the crisis part. And that is essentially what I was in, was in a crisis of what my inner life was calling for and how I was shifting and changing and what my outer life was. And they just weren't in alignment. And so I decided to leave without knowing what I was going to do next, um, which I know was also kind of a radical thing too. So that's what Carly's talking about. I shifted gears. Uh, you had mentioned something pretty profound in one of the emails that you sent me. You said that one reason I left academia is that it was so head-centered and not heart-centered. Can you share a little bit more about what that means to you about academia being very head-centered and not heart-centered? Yes, I'm happy to speak more about that. And again, this is my experience of it. So mm -hmm. I just want to say that this is my experience of academia. All this value that gets placed on the analysis and the heady parts of, of just who we are as people. Um, and I'm going to back up a little before I, I say more. Uh, I would often talk with my students when I had them in class. I created a balance statement, I called it on the syllabus, just letting them know that they aren't defined by any particular grade they would get in my class or the eventual grade they would get in my class. Uh, this real emphasis that they're not these floating brains <laughs> in my classroom, but that I really cared about their whole person and getting to know them and that they could make choices about how much energy and effort they were putting in to say my statistics course and other things they would need to balance. And that I didn't see them as their grade. I saw them as this whole person that was really rich and interesting and going through the complexities of being human. Mm. And anytime I would bring up that kind of conversation around the balance or paying attention to the whole person or how are we caring for caring for the students at Lawrence. Like, let's say I did that at a faculty meeting. You know, I think some people just sort of nodded and smiled thinking, oh, there's joy going again. Uh, but it was just really difficult to engage in any kind of conversation that was about, you know, our hearts, that was somewhat vulnerable, that was uh, letting us speak about what we care about. And it would always sort of go back to default to the analysis mm -hmm. and what's the proof and explain your answer and give your arguments. And that was just, as I learned much more about myself and was shifting and changing the contemplative practice and being very heart centered and compassionate was far more important to me and it became more and more important to me. And so that was part of that inner and outer life. I wanted to listen to my heart and do, mm -hmm. do what the heart was calling me to do. Uh, and that just didn't seem to fit, at least with the, sort of that academic achievement, accolades, mm -hmm. brainy work, um, valuing, I think, people in sort of pretty specific ways. Um, and I was interested in, in just seeing people more broadly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that, that sounds just so reminiscent of the work that I do with patients, this idea of seeing them as a whole person. And believe it or not, there's a lot of similarities in the way that therapists go about doing therapy, kind of being more heady rather than kind of heart centered. It's, it's very similar to what you're describing. And I have to ask you, where do you think you got the courage to get out of academia, actually make the decision and go for it? Where did you cultivate that? Where did you find that courage? Oh, Carly, I'm just sort of chuckling right now or laughing, not because it's not a good question. Many people have asked me that and thought it was really brave and courageous. And I've actually never really considered it that. Uh, huh. It was more that I couldn't not. Mm. that I was in a place like I often I guess think that the courage and the bravery for me came from all the work I had done ahead of time 
you know, the, the years I spent in therapy and working with my own stuff, the years or the, the weekends I spent on silent meditation retreats, really devoting myself to my meditation practice and getting to know my mind and my heart, the um, speaking about things with more vulnerability, being really real in the academic setting and around it. That was all, I think, probably pretty brave, saying no to things that I thought might impact um, mm -hmm. how people viewed me, liked me, respected me, changing like my whole um, mode of how I felt like I was, what was the sense of my worth or my value. All of that, I'd say that is brave work. That's really courageous work to start diving into that. So that maybe was where the courage was. And then once mm -hmm. I saw, it was really just like this paradigm shift. It just, it was like a ding, ding, ding. Oh, you can leave academia. Like, you can actually do that. It's a thing. As soon as that came into my mind, I knew what I was going to do. And I had some fear, not around the decision, because there's not been a moment I've doubted my decision. The only fear was around there was going to be some difficult conversations to let people know I was leaving, uh, describing that and that that might be people that might be hard for people. I might hurt some feelings in doing that and so forth. That's where the only place the fear arose. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. I I'm going to have to think about this for a while. I I. I found leaving academia, and again, it could be just, you know, I was in it for such a short amount of time. So I was in uh, graduate school in biology for about seven years before I changed. It was a, it was really scary for me, and I, I'm going to have to reflect on that more about what was so scary about leaving. I think it's just because that's all I've known. I, I, I've, you know, I, I didn't really know who I was outside of that academic circle, and being able to kind of find who I truly was 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 difficult so m maybe that's where we're kind of experiencing a little bit differently can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and kind of your journey into spirituality mindfulness meditation okay i'm going to start first with the journey because that actually relates to my time in academia i met meditation 17 years ago um, even more so 15 years ago. And it was really out of necessity because I was um, overwhelmed. I was having these anxiety attacks. I was having stomach issues. I would wake up in the middle of the night and um, my heart would be pounding. I remember my first anxiety attack. It was really alarming to me. It was very, very scary. And I've been a lifelong athlete, so I'm, I'm very in tune with my body. And my body was sending me these very strong signals that I needed to do something different. Stress was presenting in ways that I could not ignore anymore. And so I committed. That's actually when I committed. I remember that summer where I committed to essentially doing my own mindfulness-based stress reduction class that John Kabat-Zinn uh, created 40-some years ago. Um, by just working through that book and committing to 45 minutes of meditation every day for eight weeks. Uh, so I really came out of necessity. It was overwhelm. It was overwork. I was so focused on the externals. Like I needed to do more and achieve more in order to feel okay. So I was really kind of operating from a place of lack and meditation started helping me meditation. And also I practiced the teachings of the Buddha that that sense of I'm actually coming from a place of innate goodness, not of any lack. It's this innate goodness and awareness and compassion and generosity that's within me um, and nothing that I need to get externally. Now, that's a lifelong practice for me. I'll be doing that for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. That's how mm -hmm. I met. I really met meditation out of, I'd say, necessity. And then the more I practice and the more retreats I did and the more I learned, about myself, it's also just this amazing self-exploration of the, I call it the experimental lab that we have, the mind and the heart and the body. It's this really fascinating experimental lab that we each have. And meditation is one way to get to know that. It's certainly not the only way. Mm -hmm. So that's been a big part of my life 
for the last 17 years. And then as we start narrowing down more and more so, that was the focus. And since I've left Lawrence, which has now been seven years, it's been a huge part of my life is making sure that my compassion, meditation, mindfulness practice is in the work that I do, not just as an extra. Um, and so now I am teaching meditation and mindfulness in a variety of capacities. Uh, I volunteer in prison. I teach community classes. I go into nonprofits, to schools, to K through 12 education um, and working with teachers, some corporate offices, uh, really just trying to let people know how do you access this, what might seem like this, it's this very simple thing. We'll sit down and notice your breath and then you're <laughs> gonna get distracted and then come back to your breath. And very simple instructions, but it's quite complex and it's helpful to have a guide, especially if you're brand new to it. Uh, so my love of teaching, which I mentioned came out from my first year in graduate school, that stayed with me. You know, I, I've been a teacher my whole adult life, and that's a way to connect with people, to be present, to create space, to empower people. So just like I did with statistics, one of the things that brought me such joy was having someone say, oh, I'm not good at math, or I can't do stats, I've always been bad at this, and then saying, well, where is that coming from? And let's work with that a little differently and seeing them like light up when they recognize they're completely capable of doing that work. Uh, and it's the same thing when I can let someone see not something I'm imparting on them, but just what's in their own awareness. Like we have this natural insight and awareness and wisdom and innate goodness inside us. And if I can help someone tap into that, that's just, uh, it's just a really powerful thing. And I'm, I'm happy to happy and humble to be part of that process. That is so refreshing to look at kind of this, this development, this growth coming from inside of oneself, not necessarily what is coming from the outside. And I have to say this, and you've probably been told this several times, but though I've never taken a class from you, Joy, I certainly heard about who you were at Lawrence. You were very sought after as a, as a professor. People loved your classes. And it just really goes to show that, stu that student-centeredness and kind of this empowerment that you that you kind of brought into the relationship, you truly empowered people. And I, I just think that's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So I didn't know that you worked with some kiddos. I'm kind of wondering just out of my own curiosity, how working with kids is different than working with adults. How, how do you approach mindfulness with with kiddos? The work that I have been doing is mostly with really young kiddos. So three to six years old or, wow. or up into elementary school. I've been blessed to be part of a grant project here in Appleton that's bringing the kindness curriculum to the Community Early Learning Center here in Appleton. And the kindness curriculum was created through the Center for Healthy Minds. Um, a really amazing place started by Richie Davidson, uh, UW Madison. Um, and he's one of the leading experts on meditation and the brain. But they created his, the Center for Healthy Minds created this kindness curriculum, which is 12 weeks. And it's meant to be a couple lessons per week around for three to five year olds around um, empathy, kindness, emotions. Mm -hmm. What does an emotion feel like inside and outside? gratitude, taking care of ourselves, each other, the world. And the grant I'm involved in uh, is taking the research that's been done at UW-Madison and trying to extend it. So it's not a mindfulness expert coming in and giving the lesson. It's me as a mindfulness coach, coaching and training teachers in mindfulness and the kindness curriculum 
And then it's like a train the trainer model. So how is it then when the mm -hmm. teachers are giving the kindness curriculum as part of the just regular year long curriculum? So this has been a really amazing thing I've been part of for the last three years. And during that, I've gotten to give some of the lessons or come to class. And then that's expanded to doing things at elementary schools for kids, for families. And when it comes down to it, Carly, these the practice, the, paying attention, mindfulness. Actually, why don't I give a little bit of a definition here? Not definition, but my take sure. on it. Uh, sure. Those are, that are listening to this podcast right now, as you're listening, you might just recognize, am I thinking of something else? Am I planning what I'm going to do later today? Am I remembering something from earlier? Am I paying attention fully or is my mind distracted? And just really recognizing we spend a lot of time distracted in our thoughts and trying to bring our attention back to something that is much more intentional. Uh, and that may be the senses, like feeling our breath or listening to the sound of my voice. There's, so there's an attention quality to mindfulness and there's also a friendliness. So there's a, a, a spaciousness, kind of this friendly attention or kind awareness. We rarely are taught how to practice paying attention. We're told that all the time. And I, I joke with the kids about this or even with adults that I teach, like I pay attention. You know, you're sort of told that or maybe you say that to your own kids or to people in the classroom. But rarely are we given ways to try to pay attention. To just listen to the sound of the bell, like a one minute practice for the kids. Listen to the sound of the bell when you can't hear it, you know, put your hand down and put your hand on your belly and feel your breath. Uh, a lot of movement, paying attention to how it feels like to move your body. And little kiddos can do that so well and naturally. Uh, mm -hmm. Putting um, something like a little stone or stuffed animal on your belly and just noticing how it rises and falls. Uh, what it feels like when you're kind to somebody else just these really small kinds of exercises, practices that we can do that are really short because those kiddos, they have, a, you know, it's short attention span. Um, <laughs> but I think all of these that I've done with them, I can broaden out to, with adults and they work for us adults too, because mm -hmm. we need actual instruction and in how to pay attention because we just don't have that any place in our life. In fact, I think of our attention as one of the most precious resources that we have. We have this, this precious resource of attention. There are, everything is calling for that from like the people in our lives to our advertising, to all the social media, to all the bing, bing, bings that might be going off on your phone. Read this thing, watch this thing. Our attention is constantly being like pulled in these different directions. And, you know, as, as Dr. Richie Davidson says, you know, our brains are constantly being shaped either wittingly or unwittingly. And most of the time it's unwittingly. We're just trying to bring more into consciousness. And I think these little kiddos, it's actually, you can do these small practices with them and they're helpful. And we can do them for us adults too. <laughs> you know, even if you're just starting and you're 95 years old, those work just as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I, I don't have a whole lot of experience with kids though. I have read a little bit on mindfulness within the classroom and where do you see that going? Where, where do you see that practice going within the schools? Do you see it kind of becoming more of a thing within schools? Do you see it going away? Where, where do you see that going in the future? Well, there's like Joy's little dream world, and then there's like the practice of what is, <laughs> what is going to happen and what happens with regard to budgets and with themes that come and go. Uh, in Joy's dream world, uh, that would just be infused in the K through 12 curriculum. Uh, it feels like teachers and coaches uh, and different staff people that have these regular touch points with the kids, they're the ones that would be great just to do a one minute practice or a two minute practice because it's regularity that has the regularity that matters most. And 
what this would allow is just more inner resources for our kids growing up in this complex world of paying attention differently. So I believe that it can make a, it make a difference and it would be little bits like every year, little teeny bit, nothing too big, but through the whole curriculum K through 12 or pre-K through 12. And then you come out by the time you're finishing your school, whatever level of school that might be, maybe there's just a different level of understanding or awareness that you have about yourself and the world. Now, in the reality mm -hmm. is that mindfulness is here to stay in the sense that the science is backing up its health benefits. Yet, there are a lot of fads and themes that come and go. You know, the schools, mm -hmm. schools have different themes, and they may go by five-year periods or just one-year periods. And mindfulness is there for a year, but then it fades away. So I think it takes a really big commitment from a school district to do that little joy's magical world that I was talking about. And some are, some are. Uh, but I also mm -hmm. see, for example, with our grant project that we're working through, this might just be what it is, and then it it might fade away, or or maybe it would get some new surge. I do, I don't know. Um, but it, it requires mm -hmm. it requires a long term commitment, Carly. That I think a bigger picture, a long view that is that's not part of our culture. Our culture is very much like what's here now and we're on to the next thing. And we did that, check that off the list, that it would take a real kind of sea change um, to make that big difference. There's an interesting parallel process happening because fads, there doesn't seem to be a lot of attention being paid to fads. They come and go. You don't necessarily have attention on those fads. So being able to kind of undercover those fads, be like, this is what's happening. Why don't we try to lengthen this fad? Why don't we make it into something better? Um, I cannot help but think about my first mindfulness class at Lawrence. I took a, I think it was called Meditation and Virtue. And that was a game changer for me. I had not really heard of mindfulness before that class. And it was a game changer. And I was, I think, in my maybe like 19 or 20. So I'm just thinking about if that would have been introduced to me at a younger age, how would that have changed my my life or kind of the trajectory of where I ended up going? It's It's quite interesting to me that this, this fad might actually go away if it actually is a fad because it, it is a game changer. I think there's probably a lot of good intention behind it. I think a lot of people recognize that it can be a game changer, uh, but then that's maybe a lot of people to get on board with it. There's resources that need to come with it. Uh, there's just a lot of extras to support it. Uh, I don't think of it as a fad, mm -hmm. as I said, bigger picture. But maybe for any particular entity, mm -hmm. whether that be for a school or a company uh, or an organization, that it may just mm -hmm. be one year's theme uh, and then kind of float away mm -hmm. and then come back again in five years, maybe. Sure. Yeah. Would it be OK to move on to your work in prisons? I'm, I'm wondering about if you see the same process happening there? Do you see it being more of a come and go type of thing, a fad, or you see it sticking around a little bit longer there? Oh, that is a place that I have, um, I can say it has, it has been around. So I volunteer with a group called the Wisconsin Prison Mindfulness Initiative, which has been around for nine years. And we're expanding. We're now in 15 oh. prisons in Wisconsin, teaching secular mindfulness. Uh, it's typically every other week for 90 minutes, uh, group sessions in prison, and that's only expanding. So that's a wonderful thing. Part of that, wow. I think, is its grassroots nature. So if you Googled Wisconsin Prison Mindfulness Initiative, I don't think anything would come up because we're not a formal entity. We can't accept monetary donations. We really want it to be about the volunteers and the, everyone's volunteer and huh. 
have a really dedicated meditation practice and often drive a very long way uh, because it, we put our prisons, we hide them. It's like we hide our prison populations in so many yeah. different ways. So they're, you might have to drive quite a ways. So we really count on our volunteers, but this has been happening for nine years and it's only expanding. And we have those resources. So that's a really wonderful thing to, to talk about is like the changes that I've seen. I've been in four different prisons, uh, three uh, men's prisons, one women's prison here in Wisconsin. I'm now at, I'm now sort of simplified. So I'm at Oshkosh Correctional and at Green Bay Correctional. And Oshkosh is a medium security, Green Bay is a maximum security facility. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And the impact that mindfulness has for the prisoners who choose to come to group, I mean, it is, this, there is self-selection to it. They choose to come, or maybe their social worker says, this would be a really good idea for you. Uh, it, it's just really amazing, even within one session or two of seeing the, just like the kids might notice, oh, the pause of like listening to the sound of the bell for many of these people that are in prison, there's like a flash of anger, some of like really strong emotions. And the, the time of their crime was maybe 20 seconds, right? That flash of something. And being empowered to recognize they actually have a choice in that, whereas before thinking they were sort of mm -hmm. defined by that. Uh, it's amazing when that kind of aha moment happens. And most of them keep coming back and it's because it's a, a refuge space in prison and prison is a hard place to be. And I don't say that because I, I know personally, but I've heard so many stories because I've been for five years, I've been volunteering mm -hmm. uh, in non COVID times. It would be every Monday all day. I would be at Oshkosh or green Bay a mixture of both. Uh, and mm -hmm. to see them come back and learn about themselves through using this meditation practice or even just coming to group. Um, many that are in there for drug use, part of it is avoiding trauma or avoiding emotions or how can I, how can I regulate a little better and using meditation in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just been very powerful to see that impact. I've also, besides the group setting, I also do one-on-one -on -one visits. These are called pastorals, even though it's a secular mindfulness group. And it's 30 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one, confidential space with one of the prisoners. And that's very deep practice. Uh, it's very important for them to mm -hmm. so just to deepen their own practice. What does that mean? I keep using this word practice, and I just mean being able to sit with themselves and okay, I'm stuck here. Where could I go? What meditation could I do? Because meditation means a lot of different things. It's not just paying attention to breath. It can expand to a lot of different ways of being aware. Uh, and that time with those prisoners in that one-on-one -on -one setting, that's probably been my deepest spiritual practice is to bear witness with compassion and listen and ask questions. And that's where I have seen the cycles, the generational cycles of violence, of sexual abuse, of drug use, of neglect, that if somebody's in there for a violent crime, likely they were beaten up when they were kids, that they were neglected, told they were no good. Uh, and you just see this again and again and again, these generational cycles. Uh, and that's both heartbreaking to see that that's what is happening um, within our society, but it's also uh, very perspective giving because each time I hear that, I recognize that could be me. You know, if I were born into that situation, mm -hmm. there's no part of me that can know I wouldn't be in prison right now. Right. Like that's the luck of the draw with like where we're born and that that could be me and my life that somebody else is coming in to talk with me and I'm the one in prison. So that's a really important piece of understanding so that my compassion can widen. Um, and then another part of those one-on-one -on -one visits that's so powerful to me is to just be a mirror to them, to reflect back their own goodness, mm -hmm. that 
that they I, they inspire me so much. It's so hard to be in prison and they're, and yet they're practicing meditation. They're trying to get to know themselves. They're in the noise and the, all the distractions, they're more focused and making these changes. So it just inspires the heck out of me. And I tell them that, and I reflect back to them at the end of a session, this is what I see. And this is how you inspire me. Or I let them know what happened to you as a kid. You weren't, you didn't deserve that. You should have been taken care of when you were a kid and you are lovable and worthy just as you are. And the biggest, toughest guys like that always brings them to tears because they've just never heard that before. Nobody's let them know that they are good and worthy and lovable. Um, so more than that's about me telling, it's not a story of me. It's more just being a mirror so they can see, oh, okay, I'm not defined in all these ways that I thought I was defined. Mindfulness practice is so, it's multifaceted, it's multi-tiered. Can you share a little bit more about how you see mindfulness really impacting these prisoners, whether it's kind of on a personal level, whether it's, whether it's on like a very spiritual level? Can you share a little bit more about how you see mindfulness changing these men and women? So number one, finding, taking the pause, that's a huge one. Uh, and when I'm, when I'm teaching in my, any of my classes, I often talk about a three breath pause, you know, so there, I just pause for one breath and that might've felt like a lot of dead air time, you know, on this podcast. And what if you took three of those, the space <laughs> that gets created, they will often just speak about that pause and breathing and how that gives that empowers them to recognize they have a choice about how they might they act that's huge um, i've also heard a number of stories of compassion where before a, a prisoner may have been walking around and just not having any sense of compassion say for a correctional officer that's enforcing these rules um, or a, a, their, their celly, their cellmate, they call them the celly, that might be annoying them in some fashion. Just being able to flip it to say, oh, I could be in their shoes. What if I just try to be kind? That's an amazing like flip. Wow. Uh, to a number of people that really get into getting to know themselves more deeply so again, they can break free of, say, a drug addiction or an addiction of violence or these generational cycles to actually see that very intentional, I'm going to be the one to break this cycle um, to every day, you know, maybe savoring, like noticing the leaves as they change or seeing a sunset. Um, relationships. Uh, maybe create, having an intention after a mindfulness practice. I also participate in a Buddhist service at Oshkosh that uh, trying to mend relationships, trying to reach out to people, write letters to their kids or to their family members. Uh, and then at a deep level, trying to forgive themselves. I think for all of us as human beings, we're so hard on ourselves. We're way harder on ourselves than we are on anybody else in our lives. And I would say that's even more so for the people I work with in prison. So just trying to get them to even have an idea that they could like realize they were doing the best they could at that time and then to want to move forward differently, um, sort of as a form of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so incredible. A lot of what you're sharing with with me and our listeners, it sounds so similar to the work that we do as therapists, this idea of reflecting back who a person, who a person is, uh, reflecting their goodness mm. that they oftentimes don't know that they have. It, it's a lot of these processes are so similar, despite us being in different careers, the, the idea is the same. It's almost like um, we think of a mom reflecting back the baby's goodness. Um, and it, it, it just, 
it, it just makes me feel really good that that <laughs> that came up because I, I I feel that way when I'm working with patients too. Sometimes patients don't know how how good they they are and they have to be told. <laughs> and I think really that's a way level. that we can help each other because in a way we all need that reminder um, mm-hmm. that we do have that basic goodness that again we're not moving from this place of lack but more that there's that innate goodness that just gets layered over oh my gosh all the ways we like layer it up and then um how it's like we're just stripping away you know at a certain point we realize oh my gosh i want to get rid of these layers and get to what's underneath Uh, and so being that mirror for each other i think is it's part of being present. It's part of being human, whether you're working with a patient or I'm um, with someone in prison or a client that I'm working with or a friend or a family member or a neighbor or a stranger. It's like how we show up for each other makes a big difference. This is just really matters. And the more we can be present, then we're going to be able to see that goodness and then we can reflect it. And that is like spreading a kindness and compassion and sort of rippling things outward. And so, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Carly. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a few more questions for you. Um, one of them, one of them is about the future. Uh, we are currently in um, a state of, um, I don't even know what you would call it. There's a lot of anxiety in the world. Um, not only are we dealing with a pandemic, we're also dealing of, you know, with pretty significant racial injustice. Um, I'm wondering about where, where do you see the future going? Where do you see yourself going? Where do you see the future going? Um, I'm really curious about what you have to say about kind of what's, what's, What's going to happen next? So is that in relation to, say, this last seven months of pandemic and the pandemics within the pandemic? Is that sort of what you're getting at? Yes, you can take it. You can take the answer wherever you want to take it. It, it was it was kind of formulating the question as I was saying it, but kind of what are your hopes for the future? Maybe is a better way of Oh, my that. hopes for the future are... <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> prison reform, criminal justice reform, um, really c- actually not discarding people, yeah. uh, not hiding them away, but actually believing that people can change and trying to do all that we can to help them change. Public K through 12 education, I think one of the most vital things for our communities, uh, that that be revered that it just be we talk about that like people talk about lawyers and doctors and ceos and that that's where we would put so many resources those are those are those are sort of non-covid related but those are big passions of mine that they're huge and complex and i i wouldn't if i were put in charge of that wow, I'd want a whole team a huge team around because those are those are big issues but right now they feel pretty stuck. I think both the, the public K through 12 and the, and the prisons and the criminal justice system in terms of just what's happening out of the pandemic itself. And as you've mentioned, the pandemics within the pandemics of um, what we're, what we're seeing um, in terms of racial inequality and uh, Oh, just the awfulness that's in our political sphere right now, just absolute horribleness to people, the way that that is acceptable in some sense to be to treat one another. I guess what I would see with that, what I would hope for, and I don't know if this will happen, is that this is, I think, given all of us a chance, we've really gotten to see our own edges and we've gotten to see the edges of other people. Uh, and if we're willing, I know this for myself, if I'm willing to look to be kind and interested and honest about, ooh, joy, look at that edge you just met up against and how can you learn from that? That there's a lot of teaching here. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are finding out what matters most, what's most important. Um, A lot of people are maybe 
um, waking up to some things that it was pretty easy to ignore before. I might not be as easy to ignore anymore. Uh, I hope that those all stay with us in a way that's lasting so that we can move forward and make positive change. Back to my comment about how quickly mindfulness might come or go, I think that remains to be seen because a year or two or three from now, who knows, maybe it'll all just be like that was then and now we're right back to where mm -hmm. things were before, the rushing, the busyness, the accumulating, the not looking each other in the eyes. But I think there's gonna be a stamp, substantial number of people who are changed, lifelong changed. Um, and that gives me hope that like some kind of heightened awareness uh, that will be non-trivial and that could move us forward. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned this idea of change. I, I noticed the last several months now, mm. I haven't wanted to sit on my cushion. I, I've had a really hard time getting myself on the cushion. I've been doing a lot of walking meditations. Um, I'm almost wondering if I, if I sit there, it's going to be unbearable. You know, I, I think there's a lot of fear there of just not being able to sit and sit with myself mostly, but just sit down and, and remain quiet for a while. I think there's a lot. You are of not the there. only person who has said that to me. You know, I speak with a lot of people about their meditation practice. And yeah. uh, I think that that is up for a lot of people because there's, there's a lot of suffering in our world right now mm -hmm. um, and in our small communities and in our really big communities. So there's a lot to bear witness to. And I think it's important for all of us that it's like, I always think of this practice as like this lifelong meditation as honest and gentle. So we don't want to check out. And so I'm glad you're doing walking meditation. You're basically tending to yourself by saying, I might not be able to sit, mm -hmm. but I can still practice some form of um, meditation. Uh, but then it also in honoring that, it is hard to be in that. Um, I, mm -hmm. I had a, I still do have a lot of difficulty in finding ease in the space of this pandemic. It, in, in some heady intellectual way, you could think, oh, joy is kind of like being on retreat, on a meditation retreat. And I just haven't been able to orient to that, like where I could just find ease. And I think it's because I'm so in touch with the suffering mm -hmm. that's happening and I want to try to alleviate it if I if I can. Yeah. Um, but I've started doing yeah. these four hour silent retreats at home once a week in the mornings. And that was a pretty radical thing because the pre COVID, I never would have thought that during the work week, I could have find these four hours where you know, it was me and my husband here in our house, but and he totally honors it. He knows, okay, we're not, you're silent for four hours and I sit and walk and sit and walk. I listen to a meditation talk. I just eat my breakfast and drink my coffee. And those have been the few moments that I've really felt some ease, Carly. So it's an interesting thing. I know this sounds kind of radical mm -hmm. shift, that maybe it's hard to sit, but maybe if you let yourself have four hours and you can sit and walk, maybe there could be a little settling or not. Yeah, I'm certainly open to trying that. I actually, I was good uh, in March when the pandemic first started getting a little bit bad in Wisconsin. I had a silent retreat um, scheduled over the, over a weekend, and I ended up having to cancel. And I haven't been able to do any. Um, I have done some weekend retreats at my house, um, but. It, it certainly has changed. The pandemic has changed how we mm -hmm. practice and um, certainly how I practice. Um, sure. Are you okay with one more, one more question? Okay. So this podcast is about learning and development and growth. I'm wondering for you, Joy, I wonder over the last maybe say a year, what is one thing that you really learned about yourself and, and how are you going to kind of cultivate that moving forward? What's one thing that you've really learned or one thing that really 
struck you over the last year? There are so many things, right, that we've that we've faced in the last seven months in particular. So there's a lot that I have learned about interdependence, how we depend upon each other. And I think this pandemic itself has taught us so much about what we do makes a difference. Um, it impacts other people. And I've learned a lot about my edges, as I mentioned. <laughs> I've learned a lot about myself, but I can actually answer this one pretty, pretty quickly and clearly in terms of the most important thing for me uh, in my own personal growth is that uh, it became clear to me in June um, after George Floyd was killed that I, I have been, you know, I've been, I've been working in prison for the last five years and really going into prison very intentionally was around trying to um, have a positive impact on systems that are hold racial, racial injustice, like to just try to create something positive. Uh, and all this work around, like I said, compassion and generosity and my new career that I saw really clearly and in an a way that was um, couldn't be denied and was also really hard that I was using that as a way to not see how I was very much a part of white supremacy culture. In fact, that's been my 51 years of white supremacy culture as a white um, person uh, that I'm in it. Right. So I think maybe a number of people have had a new awareness of that. I had an awareness of it before. Now I've got a deeper level of awareness of it and recognizing how much I have to learn and grow and really committing to that and to work of anti-racism and what that might mean. So for me, that was huge because it was visceral. It was felt. It was and it still is. Uh, and I'm. I see it like my meditation practice. It's not that I'm just going to do, you know, spend a month or two with that and then that's done. I see it for the rest of my life. I'm going to be trying to do this work of anti-racism, just like for the rest of my life, I'm going to be doing my meditation practice. Um, and that's really, been, that's a, that's an important shift for me. Um, and it's been an amazing lesson that has been complex and very hard and difficult. And yet also uh, there's no turning back. It sort of feels like, like I just got to keep moving forward on that. Joy, thank you so much for talking with me today. I, it's been so long since we've last seen one another and it's just been such a, such a delight getting to talk with you again and getting getting a chance to catch up. Um, are there any any other things you'd like to mention before we end the podcast today? Anything you'd like to say? Anything you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, first, I want to say again, forever? thank you, Carly. It has it's just been such a, a wonderful connection to those of you listening. You're hearing us, but we actually get to see each other's faces right now, um, which is great. So thank you. And thank you to Laura. Uh, thank you to both of you for wanting to have more open, honest, difficult conversations. Uh, that's so needed. So I just uh, deeply appreciate what you're doing. Um, and I suppose what I'd say for myself and for you and for all of the listeners uh, is that, you know, this is such a complex time. And you're all doing okay, you know? I mean, like, the, just that sense of, uh, we don't have to be so darn hard on ourselves all the time and that we're not defined. I know this podcast talks a lot about identities, but we're not defined by any of those particular specific identities or any of our, you know, these, these short moments and swaths of time. Um, that that's not what defines us and that we have this, this innate goodness. We have this essence that's much more wise and aware and it gets covered over in so many ways. And just a reminder to all of us that we can begin again. Mm -hmm. And what that requires is just noticing and saying, huh, oh, look, 
I can do something different starting in this moment, not waiting, but I can start over right now. And it doesn't have to be big and grand. It can be so small and ordinary. And that makes a big difference for ourselves and for the world. Mm-hmm. That is such a wonderful place to end this idea of mm-hmm. one foot in front of the other. It's like starting over each time, each foot hits the ground and you get to start again. So thank you, Joy. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be us. here. It's been such a pleasure. This episode of the Unconventional Dyad podcast is sponsored by Anchor. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. The most important thing about Anchor is that it's free. They also have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, Unconventional Dyad podcast listeners. We are so excited that you are joining the conversation with us. If you're liking what you're hearing and you would like to support the podcast, there are a few different ways to do that. We have a Patreon page now, so if you visit patreon.com slash unconventional dyad, you can support us through four different support tiers. You can also support us through the Anchor app. There's a support function, and you can choose from three different tiers, from as little as 99 cents per month. We really hope that you are liking the content so far. You can also check out our website where we post weekly blogs that you can comment on, and we hope that you join in the conversation with us. Let us know what you think.